I am Stephen Henry Madoff, the founding chair of the MA Curatorial Practice Program here at the School of Visual Arts in New York, a program that trains um, curators in every aspect of the field. And each Wednesday, I have the chance to host this, the Curatorial Roundtable, where I ask distinguished curators, um, directors of institutions to speak about their practice um, and shows that our curatorial projects that have been transformative for them in their in their thinking and work. So I am delighted to have um, Prem Krishnamurthy today. Um, and even though Prem said, don't read a bio in a formal way, I'm I'm going to read it in a formal way and then in a more relaxed way we'll converse and Prem will present. So Prem is a designer, author, curator, and educator. His um, work explores the role of artist as an agent of transformation at an individual, collective, and structural level. This manifests itself in books, exhibitions, images, performances, publications, systems, talks, texts, and workshops. He received the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Communications Design in 2015 and KW Institute for Contemporary Arts a Year with Residency Fellowship in 2018. From 2017 to 2021, his experimental electronic book, P! Exclamation point, DF, was published by ORG. In 2022, Domain Books published his book length epistolary essay on letters. Um, Prim organizes the Department of Transformation and is a partner in Workshops, a multidisciplinary design studio. Um, the Department of Transformation is an itinerant workshop that produces sorry, that practices collaborative tools for social change. In addition to leading projects with artists, cultural institutions, and nonprofit organizations across the world, he's curated several large scale exhibitions. These include, Oh, Gods of Dust and Rainbow, the Rainbows, the 2022 edition of Front International, Cleveland Triennial for Contemporary Art, Our Silver City 2094 at Nottingham Contemporary and Ministry of Graphic Design in Sharjah. Previously, Prem founded the design studio Projects, Projects, Project Projects, and the exhibition space P, with an exclamation point, in New York. And um, we were just saying, how do we know each other? And it being New York, I don't even remember how we first met, but I went to many of the um, events and shows at uh, and that was really my first sense of the somewhat idiosyncratic and interesting way that you think about curating. So um, for the students in the program, um, we got to read a couple of things that Prem sent us, including this epistolary um, document about what he um, went through, I guess is a way of putting it for Oh Gods of Dust and Rainbows. And um, so I'm curious to hear more about that experience and whatever else you are gonna talk about, Prem. So I'm gonna hand it over to you. And then for our guests, in the last 10 minutes, um, if you've got a question for Prem, the way we usually do it is you put it in Q&A, but Prem has asked that at any point um, during his presentation, if there's something you'd like to ask, he's happy to stop, interrupt, adapt um, by answering your questions. So welcome, Prem. Thanks. Thank you so much, Stephen. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, again, yeah, I have no idea how long we've actually, I mean, we've known each other for a while, but yeah. um, I guess New York is just like that, which is also one reason why I have to admit I love the city. Um, so Hello to everyone who is out there. Um, it's been a while since I've done a Zoom webinar where I can't actually see all of you and uh, and be able to really, you know, feel like we're in uh, 
close dialogue. But that being said, I guess it's not just you all, but whoever watches this video in the future will see this. And uh, we are communing right now, I hope. Um, I also want to say, and Stephen, this is not at all uh, meant to shame you. It's just because in my 40s, I decided to just share how my name tends to be pronounced, at least how my parents taught me, which is frame. frame. It's like it's like frame with frame. a P, yes. like frame. Right. Um, and I even made up a mnemonic, like which is kind of meant to, because if you connect uh, a word to a gesture, like frame with a P, you will remember it. Um, for, you know, I don't know. Have you read The Extended Mind by Annie Murphy Paul? No. One of my favorite books. In fact, wait, let me just grab it. Um, I think for anybody out there, uh, you should totally check it out. It's a very good book for The Extended Mind by Annie Murphy Paul. Uh, it's a very good book for anybody who works with people, which I think is many people. So, um, Okay, so Stephen asked me to speak today about my work as a curator and exhibition maker. It's for me, it's a good kind of prompt and maybe even a good challenge because um, I actually don't talk about that aspect of my work that much anymore. Um, not that it's not, it's embedded deeply in my biography and what I'm interested in um, and what my passion and what motivates me, but I've come to talk about my work in a slightly different way. Um, but I think that I like to take the opportunity of giving some sort of presentation or talk or being in front of other people as an opportunity to think out loud. And so I'm going to use this as a little bit of a sketch, a rehearsal for me thinking about how to share a handful of projects that I've never even talked about publicly. Um, but um, before we do that, I do like to kind of try to have everybody be in the same space. And even though I can't see or hear you right now, um, I'm going to invite you to just take a moment and settle into where we are with a little practice, both for our minds and our bodies and our voices. And so wherever you are, I'm just going to invite you to take a moment and let your eyes close gently. And just take a moment to turn your attention to your breath as you breathe in and out. You don't need to change anything, just observe. Notice where you're sitting how your body is positioned. Maybe there's a way to make yourself just a little bit more comfortable. And then if you're in a place where you can speak out loud, I'm just gonna invite you to join me in counting out loud to 20. There's something about the act of counting and just activating your voice out loud that I think is a powerful thing. Does it make sense? So just count out loud with me wherever you are, whenever you are. One, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Hmm. 
Okay, so we can slowly open our eyes again and rejoin. Whew. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. And um, is that working okay, Stephen? Great. Um, so again, I always take these opportunities as an opportunity to think again out loud. So I'm calling today's little talk making an on making exhibitions, which is actually, I'll just jump to the very end of it. Why not? Um, and not Frank, that you should, show. Um, go to full screen for the presentation. When I, you are really I may, I, I, I tend, I tend to jump in and out because I find it like, I find it really useful for it rather than to be, just be like Ted talk style. I'm going to get up <laughs> and be there. It's like, it's like, it's like, why not show the messiness of life? But I, you know, I'm not actually going to show 120 slides today, but, um, I, I'll just jump to the very end because I'm trying to connect this. I've never done this talk before, so I'm also trying to see what makes sense. But the title itself, let's just do this. Let's just add a little asterisk there, like as if that's kind of almost a little footnote to our end, because the title of this talk comes from a project that I was involved in, in, I think, 2018 to 2020. Um, it was called Shrijan Abarton, a workshop for exhibition making and unmaking. It was a project that I was involved with, uh, originally invited by Diana um, Betancourt, who is the director and curator of the Dhaka Art Summit in Bangladesh. She invited me to invite a Swiss design collective, Common Interest, to work with a group of both Bangladeshi and Swiss architects and, you know, environmental scientists and other people to examine the impact of the Dhaka Art Summit on an uh, environmental level. The Dhaka Art Summit is a massive art event that happens in one building in Bangladesh every two years. So it's kind of like a biennial, but it's also, I mean, I think it's seen by I think the edition we worked on was seen by 800,000 people in a week. Um, so it's one of the most attended art events in all of Asia, if not the world. And we were asked to look at the environmental impact of the edition before, and then to make some recommendations on the level of exhibition design and an approach to building and designing and thinking about exhibition making that could change that footprint. And I just, I won't go into this too much now, though it was for me a really significant project. It came at a moment when I was really rethinking my own relationship to exhibition making. And so it was really amazing to have this opportunity to think with others about this with a concrete example of a single exhibition and even to just start to register some let's call them guidelines recommendations approaches strategies philosophies for how we might think about questions of sustainability and exhibition making going forward i will just say as a kind of footnote and much of this talk is probably a footnote uh if you're really interested in this topic of how exhibitions and institutions can work sustainably, there are a lot of people working on this right now, thankfully. Um, probably if you are watching this in 2028 or 2033, hopefully there'll be even more people working on it. But here in 2023, you can um, look at the work that Steffi Hessler has been doing at the Swiss Institute in particular, but also in a lot of her past projects. And, um, you know, she's really working on also thinking about how to, let's say, document these methodologies and ideas that she has. So that's where work, exhibition making and unmaking as a title comes from. And Prem, now, I'll, I'll interrupt just to say that Steffi actually spoke in the round table about three weeks ago, a month ago, so. And is that recorded too for people to, yes. to watch? That's yep. fantastic. I, I just saw Steffi last night and um, she's just a wonderful human. And um, I'm really, yeah, I like how much she's incorporating that into the actual day-to-day -day workings of the Swiss Institute. And 
So I'm going to do a little like brief personal narrative, um, but hopefully brief because I think I just spent about 10 minutes on the first slide of my presentation, which um, might mean that we're here for 20 hours, not one hour. But um, I'll just do this because I don't usually talk about my bio in this way, but I find it useful to give a little quick background. Um, so I have had a lot of lifetimes. I'm very fortunate to, I mean, I don't know, Cat has nine lives. I don't know how many I've lived yet. But, um, but um, you know, I kind of studied, I, just to give you just the briefest of biological, biographical kind of what would you call it? pathways? Uh, I I originally studied fine art. I came to art by writing and studied photography and graphic design. And after having worked and done things that were more in the intersection of performance and uh, photography and other things, I found myself a graphic designer. And that's a whole longer story. But probably this story, for the purposes of where we are now, this story starts about 20 years ago when I moved to New York from Berlin and began my first graphic design studio, actually my graphic design studio, Project Projects, which started in 2004 with the idea to work with artists, art institutions, architects, nonprofits on projects of cultural significance in different ways. And we worked across media. We still do. Our studio is now called Workshops. WKSHPS, which I run with my partner, Chris Wu. But, you know, we worked with so many art institutions from uh, MoMA to the Guggenheim to the Cooper Hewitt uh, to the Whitney. Uh, we branded and worked on institutional identities with a host of places across the world and publications uh, and, of course, exhibitions as well. And I have to say that my experience working in other contexts outside of New York was what so heavily influenced the work that came to me curatorially. In particular, I want to highlight the work that I and my colleagues did uh, with SALT, which is an institution that merges art, design, and an archive in Istanbul. Vasif Kortun, who will come up later in this, in this talk, uh, he was the visionary founder of SALT, which merged the three institutions together. There's lots of references online if you're curious about SALT, but I was asked with Project Projects and my colleague Rob Petro in particular to design an identity for SALT. And instead of coming up with a branding system that was monolithic or just was outward facing, we proposed to create an identity system that itself was a kind of curatorial space. The identity system was a place, almost like a gallery in which, a virtual gallery in which we could invite other designers to create a new version of the identity over time. And so it was this introduction, or not an introduction, it was an idea, a way for me to think about even a commonplace, not a complex, a thing like an identity system as the possibility for exhibiting and curating. And the model of SALT and how they made exhibitions and thought institutionally really influenced what I did next. Because what came next for me was while running my graphic design studio, Project Projects, I opened a project space, an experimental gallery in New York called P exclamation mark. You saw it flick by of that and we'll see more of it but it was the space to experiment with curatorial agency and different disciplines to to bring people together bring ideas into the same space because that is what i think exhibitions are really good at bringing actors objects and ideas into one space synchronously where they can actually communicate and have a dialogue there are lots of other ways of asynchronous communication Writing a book is also an asynchronous dialogue, but an exhibition space is powerful for getting all those people and things together at once. Now, after running P, which was from 2012 to 2017, or actually I should say in parallel to running P, because before P, I had curated a couple of things. Uh, I had curated some programs and a film room and an exhibition that we had done the exhibition design for as Project Projects. 
but I hadn't really made a lot of exhibitions since my college years. And so I began P in 2012 and at the same, or not at the same time, but after a couple of years began to have the opportunity to curate other exhibitions in different institutions around the world from Parasite in Hong Kong to the Austrian Cultural Forum in New York to the Stanley Picker Gallery in London at Kingston University. And in each of these, I tried to rethink how exhibitions could be displayed, how they could show both historical and contemporary work, but really work with the means of like presenting things and problematizing that, making the display itself bumpy so that people would never have the sense that there's a neutral context to presentation. Some of you may be familiar with Brian O'Doherty, um, the great artist, thinker, writer, talk show host, novelist, doctor, and more. He was one of my mentors and dear friends, and I had the privilege of working closely with him throughout the last 10 years of his life. He um, you know, wrote the book Inside the White Cube, which was originally a set of articles for essays for Art Forum. And he was one of the early, early folks who called out that the neutral white space gallery, white cube gallery is a construct. And as a designer, I'm always thinking about formats, how we can look at the formats of making something, whether it's an exhibition or a book or even a talk like this, and how you can kind of make the mediation a little more apparent so that people slow down and so that people actually take note of how you're being communicated with. And part of that is also, I think of exhibitions very much as a space for learning, as a space for engagement, as a space for change and transformation. And so throughout this period, actually for the last 20 years, since I was way too young to be teaching, I have thought of teaching and pedagogy as an essential part of what I do. Um, it's not a different thing from exhibition making. Gathering a group of humans in a space is just as intentional and requires just as much the forethought and um, consideration of formats and the modes of interaction uh, as an exhibition does. So after I closed P in 2017, which was really closed because we had a five-year lease and it was a very quixotic endeavor. So when the lease was up, we closed. Uh, I was very, um, I was very lucky to be invited by uh, KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin to have a one year residency in Berlin. And I called this a workshop for exhibition making. It's called K Kama. And it was a, also a kind of quirky meta institution, para institution that existed for a year. And our principle was that it was a space to think about exhibitions with other people from, you know, designers uh, with whom we would have like SN Parole, fantastic Turkish graphic designer with whom we had a display exhibition, her first mini retrospective in a way, which actually then was given as a gift to the Art Institute of Chicago and is now in their permanent collection. But a chance to have these kind of small scale discussions to events and talks with somebody like Carl Martin, Anyways, let's jump ahead anyways, because I realize I'm I'm taking a little more time than I expected. I've never done this before. But the point was, K Kama was a year long workshop for exhibition making. And it was but it was a chance to play with to really engage in dialogue after the five years of intensive exhibition making that was um, that was P exclamation mark while also running a design studio, teaching, writing, running a talk show, and doing a hundred other things, I needed a year to kind of reorient, and KW gave me that time. Uh, I also got to handle an Ankawara date painting, actually, for the first time, because I borrowed it from uh, Kasper Koenig. But this, so this was meant to be a relaxed period of my life, except that in the first or second month of being uh, in the first or second month of this residency, I was suddenly invited after many years of dialogue to become the artistic director of a new graph design biennial in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates uh, near Dubai. And it was an opportunity I couldn't say no to, but it was also slightly wild to have this residency, but also be supposedly curating this massive show in about nine months 
for 10 months. And so as I often have done, I said, well, I can't do this alone. I should invite other people. And so um, instead of even trying to do it myself, I invited two fantastic designers, Emily Smith and Na Kim, to be my co-artistic directors. And together, we took on this kind of massive show in Sharjah, looking at the boundaries of graphic design. And I'll try to play a short video. Stephen, it's one minute. Tell me, Stephen, if the sound dies and we can, you know, we can skip it if we need to, but I'll just try it. I'll give you a glimpse into this exhibition that tried to be, um, yeah, to try to look at the boundaries of graph design within um, a biennial format. Morreu na contramão atrapalhando o Okay, so let's just put that as a footnote. And then we'll zoom forward. I'm going to come back and fill in the years from 2018, roughly to now in between, but let's just jump forward to where I am now. Um, and then we'll go backwards again. So as Stephen mentioned, the thing that I've been working on now for the last year, but actually have really been working on for the last six or seven years, just under different names, is what I call Department of Transformation. And it's a project where thinking about how art can be an agent of transformation on multiple levels, the individual, collective, and structural. And it started, it really kicked off publicly in a teaching tour across the US this spring, where I was going to different art schools, design schools, curatorial programs, uh, agricultural nonprofits, museums, and more to share some tools, some frameworks for thinking about art and transformation, as well as some collaborative tools. I'll just share two, a couple of quick things, and then we'll jump in, we'll go backwards. This is a diagram that I've redrawn from Charles and Ray Eames. It was originally called, What is Design? But I think that it's actually a really important diagram for thinking not just about design, but about art. I've redrawn this diagram to show how what I think is most meaningful in art is the intersection between the interests and concerns of the artist or maker. You could also put a curator here too. Um, and the second is the area of genuine interest to the community or commissioner. Again, we could put an institution, we could put a museum, we could put something else here. And the third are the concerns of the planet as a whole. And it's in this space in the middle that this area of overlapping interest and concern that I think somebody can make work with conviction and enthusiasm, also with purpose and meaning. So I think it's a kind of diagram I often think about, about arts role, but also creative activities goals in general. This question of scale is really important to me. And I'm often inspired by the thinker, Adrian Marie Brown, who wrote the fantastic book, Emergent Strategy in 2016. It encapsulated decades of her activist work, her work as a facilitator, organizer, and working in social justice. As she says, in the framework of emergence, the whole is a mirror of the parts. Existence is fractal. The health of the cell is the health of the species and the planet. So I think that this is also how I think art and exhibition making as part of that can be transformative first to the individual, through daily practice and the act of making as something that is both meditative and transformative, through the way in which art brings people together. Exhibitions in particular, as I mentioned, are a fantastic form for this. They bring people together, particularly those who are different, and through aesthetic pleasure, 
can actually create new connections between people who might not and beings who might not otherwise encounter each other. This is actually a similar mechanism to what makes bees and humans be attracted in certain ways through the color of flowers. That's a whole nother conversation. And the third is on the structural level, the way in which art can actually speak with power, the ways in which it can actually speak to those in power who have economic, spiritual, political power and try to envision new ways of being in the world. Finally, I'll just show this diagram because one of the core parts of the Department of Transformation is trying to articulate, not the core parts, but where we are right now at this first phase is articulating the framework and some strategies. These are three strategies that I think design, art making, curating, and also it turns out actually food making uh, can seem to be able to learn from. Generosity, juxtaposition, and bumpiness. I think of these as three strategies. For example, generosity being the ability of an artwork or an exhibition or a work of design to be reciprocal. It's not just about giving gifts. It's also about the exchange between people that happens through gifts, reciprocity. Juxtaposition, the idea that any of these creative forms can bring together different voices, different ways of doing things into a single space and create something interesting, maybe even a little friction between those. Exhibitions are amazing at this because simply by having two radically different objects or things in a space, you create a connection between them and a dialogue. And the space of an exhibition can hold that. And finally, bumpiness. Bumpiness is what I see as a kind of response or a corrective to the acceleration of contemporary life. The ways in which all of the formats we encounter, many of them, whether it's a one-click buy now button or a TED talk or something else are manufactured and engineered to produce the least possible friction. I think that art and design and curating and many other things can introduce a little bit of friction that slows you down, that actually gives you space to think and to process and actually for things to transform. With that in mind, I'd like to show briefly three exhibition projects. Um, and I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly so that we have time for the questions at the end. Um, Stephen, you mentioned I might go a little over, but I will keep it together. And I'm also gonna share with each of them some other links to resources that you can encounter. So I'll share a brief introduction to this. And if you're curious, I'll put in the chat a couple of other things that you can uh, access in your own time. The first is Front International 2022, Oh Gods of Dust and Rainbows. Stephen already mentioned this, and this was actually what really engaged me from about 2019 to 2022. Just after the Ministry of Graph Design opened in Sharjah, uh, it was announced that I would be co-artistic director with Tina Kukelski of this massive exhibition, uh, an exhibition that takes place across every three years, across three cities, and in my case of the exhibition we did, 30 venues with 100 artists in Ohio. Now, it's a massive exhibition. I was working on the second edition of it uh, in 2022. I'm gonna go a little quickly through this, but the title came from uh, a book, I mean, came from a poem by Langston Hughes, in which he talks about the kind of essential, uh, the essential joining of both dust and rainbows, positive and negative within human life. And his poem has two different ways to look at this. But we thought about it in terms of Cleveland, Akron, and Ohio, Oberlin, Northeast Ohio itself, because Cleveland, the region is a kind of very, very, has a lot of contradictions. On the one hand, it was an area that produced tremendous wealth. Cleveland's, uh, Cleveland produced all this wealth through uh, Standard Oil having started there, steel, other manufacturing, and there's still incredible kind of wealth concentrated in the region. But at the same time, it really destroyed the environment. It created social uh, kind of division. It created segregation within the city racially. And um, 
And you can see here some of the ways in which all of this wealth also produced incredible inequality and incredible environmental degradation within the region. At the same time, there's this parallel history of healing. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous started in Akron, Ohio. And, uh, you know, it's one of, for me, one of the most interesting decentralized organizations for um, mutual support. Uh, the National Museum of Psychology is in Akron at the University of Akron as well. And this was super interesting for Tina and me. And at the same time, you have things like the Cleveland Clinic, which is the, you know, a premier healthcare organization in the world and the, fir the largest employer of Cleveland. But it's also not a problematic, inst it's not, not a problematic institution too. It has a fraught history with its neighbors and the historically Black communities around it. But, and there are also, there are efforts at urban replanting re and rewilding and, you know, a lot of interesting stuff bubbling up on the ground. So our exhibition, which unfolded over several years during the pandemic, was thinking about art, how art could be transformative. And it really was the testing ground for some of these ideas that I shared before, ideas about art as an agent of transformation at multiple levels. So I will kind of try to go through just a handful of projects that were really meaningful and that I think are really relevant. Now they also refer to ways that curating can work. I'll share two artists' work here to start. As I mentioned before, I think a lot about art, how it can be transferred at an individual level. And so I often think about daily practice. Everyday ritual or making can be a form of it that can help liberate the individual. This can happen simply through the meditative work of drawing or writing every day for 15 minutes, but it can also then happen in the material embodiment of art making. Paul O'Keefe is an artist based in Cleveland who have taught for many, many decades at, uh, at uh, Kent State University. You actually knew Brian Adarty as well and brought him there in the 1980s. But he's a sculptor who trained originally in London and L.A. But he made a series of sculptures that we displayed throughout multiple front locations in across all three cities um, of the show that dealt with the untimely death of his son by his own hand. His son committed suicide about 10 years ago and... Uh, which for any parent I can only imagine is probably like the worst, one of the worst things that could possibly happen. And um, so over many years, he made a series of sculptures that incorporate his son's poetry and his son's words. And um, I don't have an image here of it in the public library of Cleveland, but I think it was an extremely moving work because he found a way to take this trauma and work through it in a material form and actually over the three years of studio visits we did it was clear how his relationship to that event had also changed through the act of finding a material form but another example of how curating and art making can have this what i think of as a therapeutic function is the work of isabel andreessen and her late father Yudian andreessen Isabel, whose work is here on the left, is a fantastic up and coming, um, maybe by the time you're watching this video, she's radically established, but an amazing uh, artist, sculptor, uh, Dutch artist. Um, and her work has always in, in, involved these kind of complex sculptures that are themselves almost alive. They, they have chemicals as part of them, they become ecosystems. And her fa late father's work was this kind of visionary art about an ecological future. He had drawings, he self-published books. Um, he worked in a very expanded way. And, um, you know, before when we met, she felt like there wasn't a relationship between their work. And I actually, over many years, tried to convince her that there was a relationship between their work. And what we ended up doing was curating a show of their work together that she helped select. And so the process of curating the show also helped, I think, 
to change her own relationship to her father's work and to his own loss when she was a young child. So I want to point to the process of curating itself as something that can be transformative. And the second kind of way in which I think art can be transformative is through what I consider sharing joy with which art, music, movement, and aesthetic pleasure can bring different people together. Now, much of the work in front, actually, that we commissioned had this public character. So I'll just call out a couple of things that, that worked in that way. One was an installation by the Swedish collective Dansbana in Akron, in a public space called Lock 4. These are two large-scale Bluetooth speakers, which anybody can access and play music on. Um, open access. They develop these in dialogue with local dance groups and immigrant communities in Akron, and they develop the design out of that. Now, I should also mention that this exhibition happened amidst, as seems to be the case in the U.S. even more and more, a time of great social challenges. The day that I arrived, the day after I arrived in Cleveland for installation in June uh, 2022, Jalen Walker, a young unarmed black man, was shot down by the police in Akron while fleeing. He was shot 46 times. And during the entire time of our installation, most of Akron was in a lockdown. Um, and there were curfews and there were protests. And uh, this show still opened, this installation opened. But I realized at a certain point in time that even though you might not be able to protest in Akron, you could still put whatever music you wanted here at this installation because it was an artwork. By being an artwork and not a protest, it actually opened up different opportunities in public space. And I can talk more about that also if people have questions, but I do think that art can be a good Trojan horse. It can actually be a way to introduce ideas, messages, actions that might not otherwise happen. And similarly, just in a, in, in the, in a similar vein, I'm gonna share a project by Jace Clayton also, also known as DJ Rupture, which was at the Cleveland Public Library in its grand hall, which used to be a reading room. Jace, appropriate, Jace, who's a DJ and really thinks about remixing as well in his own writing, he kind of appropriated the display of the artwork 40 Part Motet by Janet Cardiff and George Burris Miller and used this audio display that they used originally to play a medieval choral work to have an array of 40 speakers in a circle. But as you can see in the middle was an interface to either plug in a phone or log in with Bluetooth and you could play any music that you wanted there, but it would be run through an algorithm that would transform and change it. It would kind of mutate it and shift it and spatialize it across the 40 speakers. And so it became a couple of gestures. The fact that you could walk into a public library and you could have young people putting on their own music in space was itself a kind of powerful gesture. The second part is that people would listen to their own favorite music and it would be defamiliarized. It would suddenly be changed and transformed. And so they would listen to it anew. In this way, it became a way of introducing what I think of as bumpiness into the space while it would also open up possibilities. And finally, the level of the structural, what I think about as speaking with power. Now, I think that what art can do is art fits, has always sat for the last 500 years, at the same tables of people who have power, um, people who have kind of, again, spiritual, economic, political power. And I do believe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm too utopian, but I do believe that art, um, and I include literature, as well in, in, in this broad category of art, can introduce powerful ideas in a way that is aesthetically compelling and becomes something that other people are inspired by to change how they live. 
Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future is a great example of this. I often say it's one of the most, the best artworks I encountered during the pandemic. Since during the lockdown, I couldn't go out and see a lot of shows, but it's a book that is really a multi-scalar look at climate crisis and different ways to think about that, uh, written as a highly engaging novel. And it's a great read. It's also a great audio book. Because of that, President Barack Obama says, this is one of my favorite books of the year. And it become, it gets on a best-selling list and companies and other activists start to be inspired by this speculative ideas that he put into that book and start to test them out in the real world. So I think that in that way, again, art can be a Trojan horse. It can be something that, uh, that through the pleasure and the excitement of reading a good novel, you can be exposed to powerful, timely ideas. That's happened for a very, very long time. And so here I'll just show a couple of things that were for me very meaningful as artworks that were included in front. The first is a collaboration that we set up between two artists who didn't know each other, Sarah Oppenheimer and Tony Cox. They're very different artists. Sarah Oppenheimer is an artist who works primarily with architecture and sculptural elements that can be manipulated and changed, but um, they often transform gallery spaces, but they're themselves very pure aesthetic experiences. Tony Cox is an artist who has for the last many decades created videos that often incorporate text, often found text from different sources with pop music or and popular music, but often in these ways that are cognitively dissonant, where the music and the text uh, kind of have some sort of friction. I keep using the word friction, that seems to be my word today. But it's also a powerful way to kind of create a different way of thinking. And they're, they're often texts and, and uh, films that have to do with urban politics, race, the way in which music is perceived, historical events, uh, current events and more but he does it in this deceptively simple format. And they didn't know each other before the pandemic, uh, but I thought that their brains might have something to say to each other. And so in 2020, I brought them together on a Zoom to chat and out of that came this collaboration, the first time that either one of them had worked together and a very powerful part of Front. The second project I'll show is actually less about how it looks, though that is part of it, it is, um, it is about what happens in the long term. So we invited the artist cooking sections who are two artist architect performers uh, who work on long-term projects around ecology. They conceived of a project in Cleveland that unfolds over three years. It's called Breathing Right. It looked at the way in which Lake Erie, the lake upon which Cleveland is built is dying. It's, it's, it's asphyxiating. It is choking because of all of the fertilizers that have been run off into it from commercial farming and which has started algae growth and is gradually killing the lake. So over three years, they're working with a series of farmers in that region who they brought together in small groups to meet periodically to try to find ways to be more sustainable, to work together and strengthen each other. There was a symbolic public installation as part of Front, which consisted of two fountains, which themselves are aerating fountains, and the kind of speculative proposal that maybe one day there would be monuments across Lake Erie, each of which would be named by a single after a single farm. That may never happen in that form, but the project received funding for this three-year cycle of bringing farmers together. And so even though Front 2022 was an exhibition that was up for three months, the ambition was always for it to be a slow show, something that would leave long traces in the world and would actually continue to change how exhibition making can be thought of. Now, I'm gonna stop there. I had two other projects I was going to talk about, but uh, that won't happen today. So instead, I'll stay with that one project and um, you know, leave it open for questions and, uh, hopefully, maybe there'll be another opportunity to share the other things that were on my mind. But thanks for bearing with me. Instead of talking about the project, 
endless exhibition that I meant to as well. I guess I talked today um, endlessly, but that's where it is. Thank you. Okay, great. Since we've got a few minutes, can you talk a little bit, you know, so much of what you said, um, including the breathing exercise, et cetera, has to do with a sort of therapeutic approach and also a very personal approach to um, not just the curatorial, but the way that you think about art, the way that you make work. Um, and, you know, interestingly, also, that doesn't include only visual work, but, you know, you've talked about literature and you've written about the importance of literature to you. How does that rhyme with um, ideas of friction for you? Because, of course, the therapeutic is to get rid of friction, I think. Maybe you disagree. I mean, but let, let's start there. Hmm. That's a fantastic question. Well, first, I would say from my own experience, I'm not I'm not a mental health professional, though I've often thought about becoming one, uh, uh, or at least adding that as a set of skills and qualifications. But I would I would say I think friction is an essential part of the therapeutic process for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think that healing on any on any level, healing requires acknowledging what is the wound or what the thing is so much of the work of therapy as i've experienced it and also read about it thought about it talked about it with other people is that you know even freud for all of the problems came, started from the point of repression started from the point that most things that are problems people carry from their childhood or from yeah childhood sexual experience or otherwise are things that are repressed so they're under the surface and for sure, the first thing that happens, I think, in therapy or in healing is that you acknowledge those things are there. You They come back to you. And that moment I've experienced is not is not copacetic. It's not like happy. It's not all hunky-dory. It's like you remember things, they come up and there's friction. Um, and I think that on a societal level, so much of what we've seen, particularly with the rise of Black Lives Matter over the last you know, eight years and other movements for social change is that we have to be aware of and okay with discomfort. So much of what happens, I think, in contemporary social relations is about pushing discomfort under the rug or like kind of claiming that everything is okay. And I think in many of these contexts, what's first needed is an acknowledgement of discomfort an acknowledgement of what doesn't sit so that you can spend time with it and go deeper on it, figure out what are the reasons for it and how do you respond to that. But that's where I think friction is essential because otherwise you're just jumping over to an end goal, which might forget what's actually happening underneath. So in a sense, um, <clears throat> we'll talk about exhibition making specifically but it applies to other things that you've talked about. Um, we could say that the exhibition is a, and this is something that I've, I've written about before, is a form of problem solving. So in, in the sense of bumpiness, friction, and reciprocity, the idea that um, it's an acknowledgement that there is a kind of friction, there is something to solve, and in that sense, which I haven't really used the word therapeutic <clears throat> before in that way, um, problem solving is a kind of therapeutic process activity that, um, you know, there were slides that you showed um, talking about healing, even sharing joy. Um, you know, these are ways that we can think about the goal of the exhibition, maybe. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Or I mean, is I that hear right for you. No, no. I mean, I thank you for asking. Again, I think these are fat, great. What you're doing, which I love, is connecting these different spheres, which I myself have never thought about. I do have a very uh, what I, I have a very specific response to problem solving, which is coming out of my history as a designer. Because problem solve, and it, I think it might just be a difference in terminology. Because I think what you're getting at is that 
um, that there is something wrong. <laughs> there is always something. It's a problem. And you're saying that the exhibition is a way to respond to that. An exhibition is a way to address that, to instantiate it, to make it physical and experiential. Um, and the only question for me is problem solving in the design discourse is so connected to a modernist idea uh, from the 1950s, 60s and onward, even that era of the Eameses, where design can offer an authoritative solution. It can take X, Y problem. It thinks through that problem and it comes up with a perfect solution that is, you know, almost as if um, foreordained. And I, I don't believe in that. Um, having worked as a designer for so long, I know that's never the case in a design process. And I also don't think that's the case for me, at least in a curatorial process. It's why I personally don't make exhibitions. I have respect for other people who do, but I don't make exhibitions that are essays or are thesis driven. They are driven by a set of questions, which is this problem, uh, problem sitting with problems asking prob asking about problems that maybe I, I take what you mean to be, but the exhibition itself is a way to think with other people or to think with people, objects, and otherwise about this problem. But in the same way that therapy is not about hitting an end goal, therapy in the way that I've always understood, even the kind of therapies that I've experienced that are more cognitive behaviorally kind of focused, which are really like, here are 12 sessions, your goal is to get this. It's not that you're healed at the end, you're going to experience traumas again, but you have tools, you now have tools with which you can address those in your life. And so if we think of an exhibition, not as problem solving, but maybe some other phrase that's about asking questions about problems, then I, then it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean that's interesting, and and we'll we'll end the public session in a moment. But um, you know, if you think uh, in classic uh, psychoanalytic terms of the analyst and the analysand, um, that process, which is all, also, of course, which is something Freud wrote about transference, um, that that process is quite interesting to think about if we reframe it in terms of you know, what the curatorial is um, and is quite opposite, say, to um, what became the moment in the history of curating, which is Zeman and the idea of the authorial curator, the one who, you know, of course, um, set a particular kind of creative path for the curator, but also um, alienated a great number of artists in the process. So, you know, there is that sense of, well, how does the analyst who is the figure sitting behind the person lying down, who is the one who has the problem and the um, the post Freudian reflection? Well, it's actually the analyst, too, who has the problem. Those sorts of relationships play out in interesting ways within a curatorial framework, I think. I completely agree. That's a fantastic way to think about it. And I'll have to think more um, soon because, but yes, like, for example, I absolutely, anyways, a whole nother strand that I'm often thinking about these days is I've been talking to a lot of artists who have become therapists or psychologists in different modalities. But for me, the work is between the curator and the artist and also the other people involved, the institution. One of the things that I curatorially really believe in is that curatorial subjectivity, which may also involve authorship sometimes, but really the subjectivity of the curatorial position is essential to reveal. It's part of the process. And I think in the process, like unlike a kind of Freudian analyst, I don't believe that I as a curator am just blank and I'm reflecting things or, you know, letting people project on me. I believe as you know, I believe that I am an active part of that. And it is my job to also give voice to that without um, so that other people know where I stand. And for example, on a basic level, when I'm writing curatorial labels or texts, 
I don't believe in taking a fictional objective perspective. Um, and I think this is a problem many institutions are facing now. They claim to have a neutral voice that is authoritative, when in fact, every exhibition is curated by a person or group of people working with an artist or a group of people. And, uh, and I actually personally believe in foregrounding that. I believe in saying how I know an artist, where I know an artist, you know, without that being the only thing happening, but acknowledging subjectivity is an important part in my mind to dismantling the myth of neutrality. With that, um, let's um, end the public session. We'll continue this um, with the students. So thank you, Prem. Um, thanks for the audience for attending. And um, we'll see you on the other link in a minute. Thank you, everyone. Bye.